Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, whenever you're looking and watching. Thank you for being with us and joining us. We're looking in Acts chapter 9 still, considering the lessons from the chief sinner. As we're considering tonight, tonight's, or this hour's lesson of waiting and learning. Waiting and learning. Do you find in your Bible translation the phrase, hurry up? Hurry. When it comes to our relationship with God or our relationship and when it comes to developing our faith, hurry up. Hurry up and mature. Hurry up and be a mature Christian. Hurry up and get over this sinful habit and addiction. Hurry up and do it. We want it to say that. We would like for it to say that. But we're hard, we'll be very hard-pressed to find the Bible saying, hurry up and grow and develop. Hurry up and get over something. Hurry up and move forward over some incident in your life and quickly receive what God will give you. No, we find... Actually, the, the opposite, we find a lot of verses in regards to the word wait and learn. Wait on the Lord, keep his way, Psalm 37, verse 34. Wait on your God continually. Again, Hosea chapter 12, verse 6. We eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Romans 8, verse 25. Jesus says, take my yoke from me and learn. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 29. I believe waiting and, and learning really goes against human, human nature, our culture, the climate, the environment that we are in. We as people, uh, generally speaking, it may not be the best at with patience and persevering when waiting on something, especially when we don't want to wait. And having to learn something, when we don't want to go and learn and put in the time to do that. We'd rather have the answer right now with no learning and no waiting at all. But the problem with this and bypassing the time in waiting and the time in learning is that maybe we miss the important lesson that we wouldn't have gotten if it wasn't for the time invested in us waiting or in us in learning what we need to know while we wait. We miss the opportunity of how God maybe is preparing us in that particular time and it seems to be the most unlikely for us because of everything that is happening. And how we are waiting and, and we don't want to wait and we just can't see what is the lesson from this, how can I what can I gain from this? And we can't see it in the moment because we're in the moment. Maybe you've looked at something in hindsight and looked back at something you've gone through in your life and you think about it in the moment. It was just hard. It was tough. It was hard. It was just overwhelming. You didn't know what to do. And, but then you got through it and there's some things that you learned. There's some things that you were able to, to hold on to and grab a hold of and it was something that really helped you. You know, Moses was delivered, was to deliver God's people, rather, from the Egyptian bondage to the promised land. But Moses didn't do this when he was a young person, was he, when he was a teenager in his 20s. He didn't just ask and receive this important mission immediately by God. It wasn't until 40 years later, as he was in his 80s, as an 80-year-old man, as he was tending Jethro's flock, 40 years tending sheep, that God called him. Joseph would be the prime minister, the second in command underneath Pharaoh, to helping preserve a nation under a seven-year natural disaster of a great famine that spread throughout the land. Again, Joseph didn't do this when he was a young man, gifted with the coat of many colors by his father. It wasn't when he was uh, just everything going well in his life and having these dreams. No, it would be after he had been abandoned in the pit by his brothers, after he was left there and placed in a dungeon because of something he didn't do, before he would reach the palace of Egypt and be in that position. 
What about our Lord and the mission that he came to do? Did he come to earth as a full-grown adult? Did he come into the world as already grown and just leading up to that final week before his arrest, betrayal? No, he came in the world as we do. He, he, he was born. He, be, he was a baby. He grew and developed. And we're told that in Luke 2, verse 52, how Jesus grew physically, spiritually, in these aspects for us as well as we grow. In developing relationships, it took time in the, the disciples that he selected, the time that he spent with them and cultivating them and helping them up when they fall and so forth. Yet we're told in the Bible that Jesus learned obedience by the things in which he suffered. Things that he, he gained in the times that he went through as he waited and as he persevered. I believe the unspoke lesson from the chief sinner for tonight's lesson or today's lesson is waiting and learning. Saul was in Damascus, yet he was sent away because of his life being threatened by the disciples we mentioned last week. Saul went to Jerusalem. Over time, he was sent away by the brethren because of the Hellenists that attempted to kill him. And yet, Saul was taken to Tarsus. Tar Tarsus would be a place that he was familiar with, a place that he was from. But look with me, if you will, in your Bibles in Acts chapter 9. Verses 30 through 32. When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Now it came to pass, as Peter went through all the parts of the country, that he came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydia. Well, as we read here in this particular text, we leave off with Saul, who's in Tarsus, and we pick up in verse 32 with Peter, and we follow him. Saul is mentioned again in Acts chapter 11, and after Peter's encounter with Cornelius and his family. The next time we hear of Saul is in Acts chapter 11, verse 25, where it says, Barnabas departed uh, to Tarsus to seek for Saul. Again, Tarsus where he was brought to because of his life being threatened and attempt to be murdered by Hellenist or the Jewish people in two different cities. How long was he there in Tarsus? What is the timetable as we see in Acts chapter 9 to Acts chapter 11? Well, we really don't know exactly. I've read uh, in, in, in places where possibly 10 years he spent there in Tarsus. I've seen five, I've seen six. I do know this, he spent some time there. He spent some time away from Jerusalem and Damascus, away from the places where he was starting to get into his own preaching and teaching and the interest that was going and reaching those and people being responding to the message and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then all of a sudden, because of the, the enemy and those that were against it, trying to stop him, had to leave to save his life. In this unspoken time, in other words, we don't know how long he stayed in Tarsus. I like to refer to this period for him and his life and lessons from the chief sinner as a lesson on waiting and a lesson on learning while we wait. The first thing I want to share with you is those silent years in Tarsus. I wonder what Saul thought about during that extended time in Tarsus. He was abruptly taken from those two cities, as, as we mentioned, led down by a basket at nighttime there in Damascus, and then the brethren taking him away from the area to Caesarea to go to Tarsus. It wasn't there, he wasn't there to see what was taking place in Jerusalem, what was taking place in areas that surrounded the city of Jerusalem, how the Holy Spirit was being comforting these disciples, and how the church was being multiplied. Yet in Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 24, again, Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 24, consider 
what else is going on. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose after Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who then they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned out turned to the Lord. The news of these came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. Verse 23, then he came and had seen the grace of God, and he was glad and he encouraged them all with purpose of heart that they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to seek Saul. People were coming to Christ in great number. In fact, so great, we were not given the exact number. Not unlike Acts 2, about 3,000 were added that day. We don't know how many were being added at this particular time. But a number enough to where they were multiplied, where they were added. I think it should also be noted, look very carefully who they were being added to. What they were turning to. That is very important for us to know that. And to be reminded of that. In Acts chapter 9 verse 21 Actually, verse 31, I'm sorry. Then the churches throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and being comforted by the Holy Spirit. They were coming to the Lord. They were walking with and in the Lord. In Acts chapter, again, as we see here, as, as this plays out, even being added and being being responsive in the sense of what was taking place, the importance of it. Going back and looking even in Acts chapter 11, a great number believe in verse 21. They turned to the Lord. In verse 24, great many people were added to the Lord. Please don't overlook that to the Lord. Who was on the receiving end? Who they were looking at? Who they were turning to? Who was doing the adding? It wasn't that the church before Christ, it was Christ. And it is Christ who adds us to his spiritual body, the church. I wonder if we get, in, if, if some in our religious and Christian world today, if we kind of turn that around. To take, to believe in Christ, to take hold of, you, you've got to be a part of this church. You've got to be a part of our local church. Be into this church body, if you will. And that's not what the disciples, those who were being converted, were doing. They were being turned to the Lord. They were being added by the Lord. And my friends, I know this was the first century, and that should be no different here in 2021. It is our relationship to God. It is through that relationship with God and being turned to Him and receiving Him and obeying Him. That is He who adds us to the spiritual body. It is clear in who adds us. When we come to the Lord, we come to him first and foremost. It is he who adds us to the spiritual body, the church. Barnabas was involved in this growth in the Lord. While in Antioch, there was this great revival. And, and in this great revival, he, Barnabas, thinking of others, Barnabas, always stepping up and being beside someone. He thinks about Saul after all these years who he stood up for and accepted, accepted his conversion, accepted his, what the Lord did in him. It's Barnabas who thought about Saul. I wonder, did he believe with all his heart that Saul still would be there after all this time? Maybe something happened to Saul? Barnabas goes to the, to the place where he expects to see Saul after all these years. And, and Saul is not in Antioch, and Saul is not in Damascus, and, and Saul is not, not, not in Jerusalem. Saul is in Tarsus. As he was sent to go to Tarsus all the way back in Acts chapter 9, he's still in Tarsus in Acts chapter 11. 
He's in Tarsus. What is he doing? I think in some of the things that he's doing, he's waiting. I also think in some of the instance, things that he's doing, he's, he's learning as well. Barnabas found Saul, it says, and he brought him back to Antioch. And Barnabas and Saul were there in Antioch for a whole year, the Bible says, assembled with the church, and they taught great many people. Look at your Bibles in verse 26 of Acts chapter 11. Something very important happened that still is to this day. The disciples who were in Antioch were called Christians. Christians. Saul was a part of that. Would Saul be a, been a part of that if it wasn't for Barnabas to have the thought, I, need to, I want to go and get Saul and bring him to I wonder if anybody would have gone to gotten, gone, would have gone to Saul and brought him back. Saul was out far away in a sense in that particular world. If you look at your Bible maps, Tarsus is on the other side, if you will, going up uh, to um, the Mediterranean. And so, I mean, here is an example of someone thinking of someone else and being willing to go and Saul being a part of that. The second thing for us, and, and, and I guess the application is, what about the silent years for us? I don't know who all I'm speaking to. God knows your heart. God knows you. Maybe you feel like you've waited on God long enough. Maybe it seems like in whatever you've asked of God, that the answer that you feel like is taking too long. Maybe life is so unraveled, you don't even see how, when, where, or even why with God. I want you to think about something. It, it, maybe you're a parent or a grandparent. Have you ever known a young child to be patient? I mean, I'm a parent, and... and and I would say, not just with children, I would say even for adults, we're generally not the best as people, especially Americans, being patient. It's really not our strong suit. That's really not something we're just gifted and born with doing. Yet it's so important and necessary for us to become what God wants us to be. James writes, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, completely working in you that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You see the transition that takes place. You see from step to step, from trial to joy, to perseverance, to perfect work, to being completed, to reaching spiritual maturity. I wonder, according to James and what he has to say, would we reach it if it wasn't for the things leading up to that? If it wasn't for the times of waiting and learning in the process what we're going through? Maybe our time of waiting is to learn more than ever before that God is God, period. It's God. It's not us. It is God who is the reason. I don't believe Saul resented God for being taken away to Tarsus because of those that were attacking him. I believe that Saul understood the bigger picture, especially after what transpired as he was nearing Damascus and the Lord appearing to him. You see, the work involves the greatest factor, and that is God. God is bigger than the worker. God is about the work, and it's inviting us to be a part of that work, which requires humility for us to wait. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. It is God who lifts us up. Maybe this lesson this evening or this afternoon or morning from Saul's unknown time in Tarsus speaks to you today, to right now in this moment. It speaks to you because it finds you waiting. If so, I would say maybe take the time to learn more from God. Please know that if you are waiting, you are in great company of others who had their season 
of waiting and learning in order to be in a better place that God wanted them to be for his glory. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We honor you. We thank you for loving us and help us in moments in our life where we find ourselves waiting. Waiting for an answer, waiting for a situation to change, waiting for circumstances. We've been waiting, especially in the time as a country with COVID and the pandemic and a lot of things are still uh, not fully open and we're still having to wait on that and uh, it can be very difficult and hard and has been on a lot of people. Pray that we can lean on you and trust in you and know that you are God and you know what is best and you are in control. We thank you. Help us. Help us to lean on you. Help us to lean on you more than we ever have. And unlike any time that we've ever tried to do, help us to fully lean on you and not ourselves. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.